about being inspired. It's about asking these guys how they started their business. And you should finish this session by asking great questions and going out feeling that you really can go and do it and take on the world. So I think, Rich, we should start with you. We know lots about you from what we read, what we see in newspapers. Have you always had that absolute confidence that things, that the businesses you want to start will succeed? Yeah, I think I've had the confidence. Um, uh, it, it may have been, you know, it may potentially have been misplaced, but you've got to, you know, I think you've got to have that confidence. Um, you know, there is, there's a very thin dividing line between success and failure when you start a business from scratch. Um, and, you know, if you don't have enough money to pay the bills, you go the wrong side of that dividing line. And if you can somehow get enough money to pay the bills, uh, you stay the right side of that dividing line. Um, and... Um, and you know, we, I, I've always, you know, I've always been running, you know, running, running faster than perhaps I should, and, and I've, I've, I've have great difficulty saying no to things. So keep on taking on new things, and um, and you know, we've we've just managed to stay the right side of the dividing line o over the last fifty years in business. Um, but uh, but equally, in those early days, when you when you're starting a business without any financial backing. Um, it's 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 easy to slip the wrong side, and and in fact, you know, most entrepreneurs do do slip the wrong side, and um, the important the important thing is then just to you know pick yourself up, um, and you know start again, and if, if if it doesn't work at that time, keep keep going until you do succeed, um, and and not to give up. I think that's a really interesting shift in the UK because that used to be a very American attitude, and it's much more acceptable now, isn't it? To not succeed at first and then come back and do something Yeah, I think, else. I mean, the best education that anybody can have is just getting out there and doing it. And, um, uh, and uh, you learn, you know, to buy, you know, just by, you know, by, by getting your hands dirty, by, uh, you know, trying something, uh, you'll learn everything there is to run a business. And, and if you can run one business, uh, you, can, you, can, you can run any business. You know, you've just got to make sure you find the right people to... Uh, head, head them up and, and run them, uh, but once you've had that, you know that experience of running one business, then um, you, there's no reason why you, you shouldn't be able to run almost any any, any business there is. Okay. Okay. I think just if I could add to that, I mean I think there are there are two things that drive businesses. Uh, one is is the mechanics of a business. That's like the budgets and having the skills that you need to produce reports and produce stuff for the bank and all the rest of it. And then there's the dynamics of the business. And the dynamics of the business are really what's most important because that's the ideas and the passion and the drive and the initiative. The, the, the dynamics of business are all to do with people. And, and that's where entrepreneurs are really good. We're really good at the dynamics of the thing. And, and the problem with British industry is that it's too mechanical. There's not enough entrepreneurs in the big companies that are lead our nation, in my view. But the corollary of that, and I say this because it's, it's an audience of entrepreneurs we're speaking to, watch the mechanics part of it. Because I used to have a pal, and he was, he, was a, he was great fun. His office was full of really good-looking, very entertaining people. But his business wasn't doing that well. And he said to me, um, what do you think I'm doing wrong? And I said, you need to employ some ugly people that are really good at what they do. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you plenty of examples in my organisation, but, but, but actually there is a thing about having the mechanics right, and I'm not a mechanical person, I hate mechanics, right? but I do recognise a couple of times I've had to really concentrate on bringing my mechanics to keep up with my dynamics. Dynamics should lead the business. But if you don't get the mechanics right, then you can sometimes run into big problems, and when, especially when you have cash flow problems, all the rest of it. Having somebody that actually can advise you about that and, and help you with that can sometimes be quite important. Jimmy, explain what you do. Jimmy's very on brand, by the way. He's brought his products bought on everything. Today. Hopefully, has everyone had a nice coffee? <laughs> okay, amazing. Did anyone not like it? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Better to ask you that way around. So um, Jimmy, Jimmy, br Jimmy brought his coffee. Brian didn't bring his buses, and I didn't bring my planes. <laughs> <laughs> my planes. Um, <laughs> um, so my, my my kind of background is I was um, um, I was a labourer in the winter down in Bournemouth, moving bricks around, and then in the in the summertime I dress up as a mermaid, introducing bands and acts on a stage. 
um, and kind of realized that's not for me. So I went to Australia, where they sell amazing ready-to-drink iced coffee. And I came home, and no one was making decent iced coffee. And um, there's a, I thought about this question, and uh, the most important thing is a quote from the movie Babe, the pig movie. Um, and the narrator says, um, Farmer Hoggett knew that little things that niggle and nag and refuse to go away should never be ignored, um, for in them lie the seeds of destiny. Um, and I basically had that niggling thing in my head the entire time, just saying, Jim, go and make iced coffee. So I thought, I don't really want to be a mermaid anymore, so I'm going to go and make some iced coffee. So I did. And at what point, Jimmy, I'll start with you on this, but what point did you start to think, I, I can do this, this is going to be successful? I think it was a case of um, making sure there was a category for iced coffee, because the UK is, is a phenomenal tea-drinking um, entity. And we went to supermarkets and realized that there was loads of iced coffee on the shelf, but none of, the, none of it was right. I, I pride our stuff on basically just branding, packaging, and ingredients, because there's just three things involved in that. And if we thought, we thought if we can nail that, then um, we'll absolutely smash it. Um, and then also looking at places like Starbucks and Costa and Cafe Nero, um, they all had their iced coffee boards up throughout the winter, so it was another sure sign that the category is growing for iced coffee. So we thought, let's give it a whirl. I you think remember back when you thought it was a success? <laughs> <laughs> I think for me it was, uh, I used to work in Aberdeen at one point and um, it was really difficult to get there. And um, so <laughs> I decided when, when the buses were deregulated, that was an opportunity to run bus services to Aberdeen. And uh, so really the, the, the idea came from really my own experience that there was a, a lack of service and a service that really needed to be provided. And I always really believed in it. And when we started the first service, there was only three people turned up at the bus stop. <laughs> and, um, but I, 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 could, my, I had a vision for this. I could see that the, that the patronage was there. And, and, and now there's like you know, 30 trips a day over that corridor that, that we started with, with just three passengers. So I'm going to ask Jimmy this first, so it gives everyone else time to think about it. But Jimmy, is there an, a good lesson that you've learned? I know you're quite a recent entrepreneur, but is there one bit of wisdom, perhaps, that you would be able, you think to pass on to someone else if they were asking you or telling you they were thinking about going into business now? Um, I think if, it, if it's thinking about going into business, then maybe the time isn't right. If they definitely want to go into it, then and they've got the right idea that doesn't leave their brain and constantly is, is almost like a little virus in their brain saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. That, that, that's what I've learned from our thing, is without that, or without the right idea that gets you out of bed every morning to go, I'm going to smash this day with as much stuff as I can possibly do, um, I don't think it's, it's not the right thing to do. A lot of people go into business with um, friends or, or partners of some description. I think that's my advice would be about that. Um, I think if you... If you select the wrong partner, you'll end up in all sorts of problems. Richard and I have been partners now for quite a long time, and it actually works okay. Richard does all the marketing and all the, all the, all the, all the sexy stuff, and I empty the toilets, you know, and it works really, really well. But you could do a better job at that, too. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's another issue. But anyway, um, the, I think that... that Sharing values with people is really quite important in the partnerships. And, and I was very fortunate because in, in our business, actually my sister was a partner and, and we got in really well together and we had a lot of shared values and, and a lot of fun as well. And I think that's really important because if you get the wrong partner, it's a nightmare. You have a lot in common with Jimmy, actually, because he's in business with his sister. Yeah, my sister's here today. Suze? There. <laughs> Woo! Um, so, yeah, Suze is my business partner and it's been epic, I think, to have a business partner when you're, when you're starting out, it means you can go and have a beer with someone after work and chat till about 3 o'clock in the morning about new stuff, and you can't do that when you're on your own. And I think the other thing about starting with either a really good friend or, or, a, or a sibling is you've got immediate trust, and if you don't have trust, you've got nothing. Um, and that's been really amazing with, with working with Suze. Okay. And Richard, I think, um, I think what Jimmy said earlier about how, how he got his idea was, was you, you said you were in Australia? Or was it? Yeah. yeah. And, and he could see mm -hmm. that they were doing something better than was being done in the UK. Um, and I, I, there, there are a ton of great uh, ideas come emanating from America, from Germany, from around the world. Um, and I don't think en enough entrepreneurs actually keep an eye on uh, trends that are happening around the world and then think, 
wow, you know, th they, you know, they've they've done all the groundwork. They, you know, they've they they they've d they've discovered this new product. They've discovered this new idea. You know, let's you know let, let let's take the elements of that and bring it to the UK. Um, and you know, that's something I would defi definitely definitely you know rec recommend. So, do you think that curiosity then is a really important quality for an entrepreneur? That sort of thirst for knowledge and desire to find something new. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think um, uh, just being interested in every aspect of life, you know, um, throwing yourself wholeheartedly into life, um, and and a lot of the best ideas come out of personal frustrations. Um, I mean, I've written this in my book, but you know, I mean, I was in. You know, Puerto Rico one day trying to get to the Virgin Islands and um, and I had a lovely lady waiting for me in the Virgin Islands. It was six in the evening. I was determined to get there and American Airlines announced they've cancelling the flight. And um, so, you know, myself and 50 other people were all uh, upset and I went to the back of the airport. I hired a plane. I was 28 years old at the time, so I took a bit of a risk. I wrote, got a blackboard and I wrote $29 one way to to the Virgin Islands and went out to all the people who got bumped and filled my first plane. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, it, and, and, you know, as we arrived in the BVI, um, somebody said, you know, sharpen up the service a bit and you might be in the airline business. And, uh, and I ended up the next day ringing up Boeing and saying, do you have any second-hand 747s for sale? So, um, you know, so, you know, it was out of frustration that we ended up getting into the airline business. Um, Obviously, the lady was happy that night, and, and the frustration <laughs> has all gone away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm bringing us back down to earth a little bit. So we talked this um, earlier today about the importance of having a mentor, particularly if you're in the early stages of, of setting up a business. Um, and Jimmy, you've talked you've, you've about having your sister and uh, and beyond a mentor. But Brian, perhaps um, you can answer this. Do you think it's important to have someone who's beyond the immediate business to have as a sounding board? Well, I, I think it's helpful to have a mentor. I don't think it's always fundamental. A lot depends on the personality type. And actually, Richard just proved something really that really probably most of the people in this room have got kind of something wrong with them mentally, um, which is why, <laughs> why because, because we have, we are... We, I mean, my wife always says that actually you've got to be crazy to do the stuff that we do. And there is a craziness about being an entrepreneur because you just see things differently from other people. And, and I just think that... But I, I had a mentor, in my case actually, it was my father who was a bus driver but who had a whole lot of different businesses going as well as being a bus driver. And actually was a very good trader and you had to buy and sell stuff and he taught us an enormous amount about that and I, I would have said that that you know a lot of the fundamental principles he always used to say if, if you buy it at the right price selling it's easy you know that's elementary stuff but I kind of remember all these phrases yeah. he taught me mm -hmm. and actually I, I, in the banking crisis um, I remember that my father used to keep all his money in the house he had a really good reason for that because he never ever paid any tax <laughs> <laughs> and he lent all this money to us to start Stagecoach. And in two years in, the tax inspector said, where did all this money come from? This bus driver said, well, you know, he had his redundancy money. And I said, oh, they're very good living. You don't smoke or drink and all the rest of it. He said, look, <laughs> this is a lot of money for a bus driver. So I decided to come clean with the tax inspector. And I said, look, my dad had all these businesses, but he never paid any tax. And he never paid tax to this day. And I actually, Anne and I actually paid his tax for him because he just wouldn't pay it, ever pay his taxes, right? Um, but the reason I tell the story is, in the middle of the banking crisis in 2008, I said to Martin, how much money do we have at the Bank of Scotland? He said, 140 million. I said, move it. <laughs> and I, and I realised, my father was so smart, because if your money is in the house, then if the bank goes out of business, it doesn't make any difference. And I said to my guy that's in charge of suit investments, Andy, I want you to get a Brinks van, and I want you to draw all our deposits out, <laughs> and I want you to put all the money in the van, and I want you to park it in the drive at the <laughs> house. <laughs> he said... He said you're not serious, it's Andy, I'm looking at you, I've never been more serious in the end. I'm beginning to think, this old bus driver really taught me a lot, thank you. Uh, come on, you've got to finish that story. What, what happened at the 140 million? We moved it to other banks. The skull went burst. Uh, they, um, yeah, I think, um, uh, I, think I, I, I haven't ever had one mentor, but I think 
Um, what I have learned is, uh, is if you're a good leader, you just got to be a great listener, and you, and uh, and you just got to get out there and you know be asking questions, listening, uh, learning, writing writing things down, um, and absorbing you know absorbing knowledge all, all the time, um, and uh, and everyone's got something you know to teach you. Um, I, you know, I often find that lead, leaders are apt to, you know, to, to talk a lot <laughs> and, and not, not to listen uh, half enough. So, um, so, uh, you know, so I think a lot of, a lot of my success has come from, you know, draw, drawing, drawing people out and learning. Great. Okay, audience, this is your chance. Please ask, feel free to ask loads of questions. Can we put um, the lights up so we can actually yeah. see everybody out there? <laughs> Fantastic. Where shall we start? So, oh, where is the mic? Sorry, I can't see. So, okay, so let's go. I can see one down here, first of all. We can take questions from people if you can shout, because there's only one mic. So. Um, hi, um, Jimmy, you brought an idea that was popular um, in Australia to the UK. Um, I've noticed um, there's uh, bigger gaps in the market in uh, other countries around the world. Um, so if I, for example, um, you know, fish and chip shops are becoming very popular in uh, Pakistan right now. Um, and yeah, <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, do Virgin Startup um, help uh, businesses that want to um, you know, take advantage of gaps in the market abroad. So, for example, if I were to introduce something quintessentially British to, like, um, I don't know, kebab shops in uh, Brazil, would you help me do that? <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would hope so. Um, I, I, I think, I'm not sure whether there's, there's... I can't believe there would be any rules that would prohibit that. Um, you just like those Brazilian girls, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can't say I blame you. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, uh, you know, but it, yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the, the only danger of uh, you know, I think the loan, the loans are sort of thirty thousand, so you could get through the airfare. You know, the airfares could t use up quite a lot of that money pretty quickly if it was in, if it was Brazil. But um, but. Um, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I see no reason why startup loans shouldn't. You know, if people want to set up businesses overseas, um, I, I, I see no reasons why, why we shouldn't be able to do that. Somebody may tell me I've, I've, I'm wrong, but I think I think that should be right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. Sorry, because of the mic, I'm gonna go here. Can you shout? Yes, yeah, go for it. Hi guys, I'm <coughs> So if people didn't hear that at the back, do the panel have any sort of ritual that helps them stay focused? I think entrepreneurs tend to not be ritualistic in their approach to things, but quite disciplined in some ways about what information you would gather or look at. I just tend to have key things that I, I've worked out in my mind are really important to all the businesses that I'm involved in. So I tend to get them fed to me each day and, I, and, and I've got a good memory for numbers for some reason, and I, I, I kind of remember the trends if I get the numbers fed to me. So that's how I control the, or, or monitor the businesses that I'm involved in. I, I just try to um, uh, keep fit, because uh, I think if you, you know, if you can, uh, you know, I'm lucky, I live, live in a place where I can go kite surfing or surfing and you know, just try to find fun ways of keeping fit. But, um, but if you can, you know, if you're, if you're feeling really fit and healthy, then everything else flows from that. So that's something I'm trying to try to make sure I look after myself. Um, I guess I try and go because we're based in Bournemouth. I'm try and get to see the sea every day. Um, just swing by the beach, um, get a good idea of what perspective is all about, and then you go to the office. And having that ritual of going and seeing something so unknown and, um, and quite vast. It sounds quite hippie-ish, but it's a really good way of um, starting the day. So yeah, going and getting somewhere where you can get some big perspective every day is a, is a good thing. Okay, there's a question here. Do you, do you have a ritual? I do. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Well, I try and stay healthy and fit. Running helps me focus, but every Monday I'll sit down and focus on the product and listen to the customer feedback, make calls to customers, see how they're getting on, and then help 
me keep check of what we're doing that we're in the right direction. And the reason I use ritual and not habit is because habit is something you use cigarette or you're a coffee. But a ritual is something you force yourself to do, but ultimately it helps you keep your focus. Sounds good. I might steal that, <laughs> steal that, steal, 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 steal that, and write a blog. And anyway, <laughs> thank you. Tag me in it. <laughs> so there's sorry. There's a question here with the mic. Hi there. Um, I've heard a lot of the phrases being started with entrepreneurs can. Um, my question is about, do you think any type of person can be entrepreneurial? I, th I think what these guys were saying earlier about being a little bit crazy, um, you have to be a little bit crazy because some of the stuff you do uh, that you reflect on and go, oh my word, what on earth was I doing? Um, you have to be that, that little crazy factor. And if you don't have that crazy factor and you're not prepared to go and do something completely ridiculous at three o'clock in the morning, like trying to sample iced coffee um, in sideways sleet at a train station at four in the morning, um, but then it opens up a new account because the buyer from a certain large corporate company is there. Um, you have to do those kind of things. So I think, yeah, you have to be a certain kind of person. Yeah, I think it is a mindset. I mean, I think we see opportunities where others just see problems. And, and I just don't think you can help being like that. The other thing is you, we're quite obsessive. Once we get into it, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you, it is quite addictive, you know, you can't help being interested in it and following it and, and asking about it and, and encouraging people about it and all the rest of it. So I, I think it is actually a bit of a personality type, to be honest. I'll try to be a bit more a bit controversial. I, I mean, I, I, I think that if you've got an, if you've got an idea that can make uh, other people's lives better, um, but you think, you know, uh, I'm not necessarily entrepreneurially Bend, I would just say, you know, d d just forget that thinking and just just try it. And and I, and I, th I do think that um, that you know that most people, if they try it, um, uh, they'll learn about it. And you know, they may not become a serial entrepreneur, which is not necessarily a good thing. They may just want to you know just specialize in that one that you know that one that w that one thing that they've they've got a passion for. Um, uh, you know, so I, I think most people ought to be able to become entrepreneurs with, if they put their mind to it. Okay, I'm just... just do, what, what, do, what do you think? Are you an entrepreneur? Uh, we're launching an online course to try and encourage as many people to come forward to say, actually, I have an idea and the background and I'm about to share it through this course and how will that help to um, launch the business and give them the confidence to actually tell other people about that idea? Brilliant. Good luck. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm just going to be organised because I'm conscious there's going to be loads. So someone with a mic here, then there's the lady in the check after that, and there's a guy over there. So that's the first oh, order. And then, okay, and then you. <laughs> let's do, let's do the mic first. I know, I know. It's, right. So I'm, question. I'm running the London Marathon at the end of April, and as you know, um, Virgin uh, Money Giving sponsors it. I'm a little way off my target at the moment with the charity that I'm running for, <laughs> uh, Community Network. So I was just wondering, being that you are a marketing PR guy, would you mind if I have a photo with you at the front just to help my cause to get up, a, bit of a, a bit of boost? <laughs> All right, next question while we're doing this. <laughs> You need the logo. You need <laughs> PR, you but you need also you need the crowd in the background. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, the lady in the check dress. Yes, shout. Yes, fine. Okay, so the question was, what questions did you ask yourselves before you set up your business? Well, I had to ask myself a question because I had a decent job at the time. Um, Richard, I'm just a layabout, you know, and a hippie and all that, you know, but I actually had a proper job, you know. And, um, <laughs> what, what, what's that? <laughs> um, and so it was quite a consideration for me to actually give that job up and start a bus company. So that was a, a big consideration. But what, what I decided to do was to kind of do it incrementally and I, I, I kind of moved towards being an entrepreneur. That, that's not very courageous, you know, but I, I, I kind of had things I could still do to earn money as well as keeping the business going. And we didn't actually, both of us, release our, our jobs until we really saw the business was taken off. So, you know, I know sometimes people say it's death or glory, but sometimes if you've got a profession and you've got a job, it's not a bad idea to hang on to that until you, you really feel the, the, the project can sustain you. Thanks. Um, 
I thought, well, do I, do I want to be a mermaid um, introducing bands anymore? And I thought, no. And do I want to move bricks around in the winter and stare at an old guy's bum as he picks up a broom off the floor? And I thought, no. Um, those were the two things that made me start uh, doing what I wanted to do. Um, well, I was at school, and uh, the headmaster asked me the question, to, uh, you know, like, either, either, either you... I, wanted, I was running a magazine, and he said, either you run the magazine and uh, you leave school, or you... Um, don't run the magazine and get on with your schoolwork and you stay at school. And that was an easy, easy answer. So I, I, I quit school at 15 and, um, and went off to run the magazine. But I never actually thought of it as a business. I, you know, I was passionate about you know, getting this magazine out. There was an unjust war, the Vietnamese war going on, and we wanted to use the magazine to campaign. And, uh, and the business aspect was just at the end of the year was the more money coming in than going out. And you know, just had to cross fingers that we had more money coming in than going out. But um, so, you got a business? I wasn't really on credit for the company actually helped me. Oh, my husband wanted to grow, and I thought I got to do it. Brilliant. So you you've got how you got how many companies are you? Congra <laughs> congratulations. Nice to see you. Um, I think there's a, there's a question actually, sorry, with the mic. So I'm just conscious that I think it's in the middle. And sorry, I will come back to you. Don't Hello. worry, don't worry. <laughs> Hi, this is a message for Richard. My name's Danny. I, I run a recycling plant in Manchester. Um, no matter how big your dream is, like your Virgin uh, Galactic, how would I be able to speak to somebody regarding fueling your jets with, <laughs> with fuel? <laughs> Made from plastic. I can't see where you are, so I'll just look. I'm here, generally. sorry. Um, but um, the um, well, look, we we've been working very hard to uh, develop clean fuels for our planes, um, and you know we, we're looking at algae-based fuels. We're looking at um, isobutanol-based fuels. Um, we, 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 we've actually talked work, working with a company that's taking the waste product that comes out of the chimneys of. Uh, steel plants and aluminium plants and, and turning that into jet aviation fuel instead of it going up into the environment. Um, plastic, um, if, you can, if you can turn plastic into jet aviation fuel, um, we'd grab every, every bit of it you could, you could give us. Um, uh, so, um, so Patrick McCall, who's over there, <laughs> will, uh, will, will, will stand up and try to find you in the audience. But we'll, we'll, you know, we, we, it, it's in incredibly important that um, the world, world moves to, you know, a world that is powered by clean, clean everything. Um, and, uh, and obviously, um, aeroplanes is, 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 is one massive box to tick um, if we're going to get to a carbon neutral world by 2050. I just I add to that that, that we... Um, I've got there first. <laughs> Sorry, you can't have it. <laughs> yeah, we, we were looking at um, alternative forms of, for the fuel for the buses, and uh, we discovered that you can use, res you can use old chip fat and we've got a big supply of it in Scotland which is great so we, <laughs> we actually we actually bought into this company that was was using that to to make diesel and um and when we found that our passengers just loved the fact that the bus only had 15 percent of the carbon footprint of, of mineral diesel so I would just encourage you with your project because uh, I eventually sold out to uh, some Chinese people and made a lot of money off my business and I hope you're able to do the same can't see you out there but all the best with that one so there's a, there, we're running out of time, so just a few more questions. The mic's here, so... Um, people just don't believe in you and think you're too crazy and you're being inappropriate, uh, where everyone just don't believe you. In, uh, just don't believe you. So if you do come across such situ situation, how do you just pull yourself and overcome these obstacles? So if people don't believe you, how do you kind of go forward and go past that obstacle? I think this thing about people not believing you and thinking that what you're doing is crazy is the great advantage we have as entrepreneurs because it takes them a while to work out that actually this is really working. And what happened was is we, we were actually going for 18 months and everybody said exactly what you're saying. These guys are completely crazy. They can't possibly make this work. Then all of a sudden, people just waking up one morning and said, well, this is really good what these guys have done. And everybody started to copy us. So the longer they think you're crazy, the better it is. <laughs> um, do, do you want to answer next? Um, yeah, fine. Um, I think 
with us on a, on a day-to-day basis, that's talking to supermarkets. So some supermarkets will go to and they'll go, you're crazy, there's no way we're going to list your product. And then some supermarkets go, do you know what, you're the perfect fit for our supermarket. Um, so it's a case of going back to the other one and tailor-making your package, not so you change, but making sure that you come in with the right kind of angle and the right kind of business excuse for them to put you on, on their shelves. So um, yeah, maybe going back better prepared or um, yeah, going with a different angle but staying true to what you're doing in the same, in the same instance. Yeah, when we launched Virgin Atlantic uh, 30 years ago, uh, the New York Times did a review and they, and they did some market research and they said, you know, first of all, with a name like Virgin, it's, it's not going to go the whole way. Um, but, um, uh, but, but, sec- <laughs> but secondly, that um, uh, they did market research which said only 7% of people would um, fly on an airline called Virgin. And, and we put our hands up and said 7% would be just fine. So, uh, <laughs> and, and so we, we carried on with it. But there were, a lot of, there were a lot of skeptics out there. And there always will be lots of skeptics when you, when you want to start something new. Everybody will tell you why it's a bad idea, um, why you shouldn't do it. Uh, why you'll you know lose everything you've got, and in the end you just got to get out and try to prove them wrong. But good luck. Brilliant. I have you started? Have you started a business? Uh, I'm still in the early stages, but we have plans to develop a business right now. Yeah. So you're that one. Yeah. Great. Well, good luck. Maybe maybe start maybe start developing it while you're still at university and not wait. But anyway, good luck. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, that's a really great note to finish on. Thank you so much, panel. That was really brilliant, and I hope everybody feels uplifted, inspired, and enthused. Thank you. A big round of applause, everybody, for Sir Richard Branson, Brian Suter, and Jimmy Kagan.